It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to the Jill on Money Show, the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. We do that by answering your questions. We are starting with Michael, who's on the line from Seattle. And we are excited because Michael was excited to, he just says, oh, thank you so much. And he was so sweet. So Michael, we're very happy that you're joining us. What can we do for you? Well, thank you so much. I, I am very honored to be able to talk with you. And I'm in the middle of a reset. Uh, the company that I was working for was just bought out by a much larger organization, and mm. I may be in the pro- I'm in the process of not knowing: Am I going to have a job? Am I not going to have a mm. job? Do I have enough in savings and in retirement? Um, should I be thinking of early retirement, or you know, just what what my next step should be? A couple of uh, color commentary questions: Was this expected? Eh, we found out about it in last year so but yeah. you knew that they were trying to sell or not no no we oh, did you had not. no idea so no. last year you were like oh my gosh how old are you michael uh 63 mm. are you married single What's single going on? so uh right now how much are you earning so the annual salary is a little less than 140,000. bonus or not uh yeah right now the target is 15 percent do you usually get that um i did at the old company <laughs> oh, right. Good point. Very good point. Good point. I understand. Single dude making money all along the way. Uh, how much money have you put away in advance of this purchase? So what do we what do we have to look at in case you do get uh, how the how the technology world says right size? Right, right. <laughs> so as far as um, cash, including you want me to include 401ks and let's do let's let's go backwards. Let's just say cash on hand, like that's been like in a bank account, in a CD. What do you got? Um, one twenty five six five. Okay, calm down. One twenty. Okay. <laughs> and what else? Do you have a brokerage account? Um, I have a few of them. Can you give me the total? The total in brokerage accounts was is uh two million one hundred eighty one thousand one hundred fifty five and some change. Uh, all right. So that's all been taxed, all invested. Well, yes. However, some of it, we had um, RSUs, employee stock purchase, and Mm -hmm. grants that were just cashed out. And Mm -hmm. so I'm waiting to see what the tax implication of that will be. Uh, So with the purchase, all of your stuff popped, right? You get taken out. You don't know the tax liability yet. Yes, correct. And that tax li- And so the tax event happened in 24 or 23? Um, the majority of it was in 23. Oh, you bet. They better get you that tax liability. Like, yeah. You got to you got to file your taxes. Hmm. OK, so but some chunk of that is going to be taxable. We don't know how much yet. Yes. OK, next question for you. What's in your retirement account? OK, so I have a few of them. I have um... this is a theme. You have like a few. You like fews. OK. <laughs> Well, okay. I've I've worked at a different places. So as far as like my the big the big one, do you want to know about asset classes or no? I no. just want to know. I could not care less. What's okay. The total. Okay. Well, in one of them, it's one point one six five nine four five. That's the biggest one. Just give me the first four numbers, dude. Why are you making me work so hard? I don't know. One point one six five million. Yeah. That's in one, and that's all pre tax, right? Yes. Not Roth. Yes. Okay. That is pretty Next one. The next one is Fidelity, and mm-hmm. that's a mixture of past and also a brokerage account. And the total for that is 431571. What was the rule I just told you? I know. Jeez. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. You are? Don't worry. So, the, okay. But that Fidelity, it's old retirement accounts and... The new but one, it, the four three one account, the four hundred thirty one thousand, four hundred thirty two thousand. Yes, that also is pre tax mostly. Yes, except okay, for about it. well, there's an individual brokerage account in there as well that has about seventy eight thousand in it. Okay, okay, seventy eight k brokerage, got it. 
but not Roth is, I guess what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So now we have your retirement accounts, your Fidelity old retirement account, plus a little brokerage. You've got your big brokerage, 2.1 million, almost 2.2. We got to pay some taxes on some of that 120 grand on hand. What other assets do you have? So I also have um, a house that's about uh-huh. six fifty, and uh-huh. I own oh one hundred and fifty eight on that. What's the interest rate on that? Three point five. And this is a house. If you get if you get blown out of work, you want to stay in the house. Um, I have a nibbling that is only fifteen, and um, I have to stay in the house until they're in college. Got it. Okay. What about college for the 15 year old? Yep. I'll be paying for that. (laughs) Is there a 529 plan or not? There is not. I had started one years ago, but then Washington state was doing something funny. So I got rid of it. And that Mm. was one of my questions. Does it make sense to like put 40 grand or whatever it is into one of those now Mm -hmm. when they're going to be doing running start here soon. And so is the, is, is it 15 is a freshman right now in high school or a sophomore? Uh, what it's a sophomore. Do you think that this kid's heading to college to in state or out of state? Like, what do you think we need to really set aside just, you know, for planning? So I do know they want to go to community college locally. And mm. outside of that, they've changed their mind so many times on what they want to do. But <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so we don't want to overfund it because you only have one kid. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, yeah, it's my kid. That's not my kid. Oh, so a nibbling, nice. a nibbling is a, a, a non-binary niece or nephew. How would I, how would I know that nibbling Mark, you got that nibbling a non-binary niece or nephew, or is, niece or nephew. All right. I learned something today. Thank you. Whose kid is this? It's, <laughs> it's my ex-wife's uh great niece oh my god yeah it's go. complicating Good jill Lord. you really don't want to know all right non-binary niece or nephew yes and so community college for a couple of years but that's it do you have any um anyone else you're um taking care of like a sibling parent nothing nope the ex-wife is dealt with right yes okay How much money do you think you need to live on in a given year or a month? So right now, um, expenses are probably, eh, depending on how extravagant I want to be, they're usually less than $4,000 a month. So what is your Social Security full retirement age benefit? Do you know that? I do not. Mark, you have a guess for that? At a 63-year-old who's been making a hundred. 20, 30, 40 grand, maybe 50, 60 with a bonus? I would say not not less than 3,500. That's what I was thinking. I wrote that down. So thank you. Uh, so you don't, you got plenty of money. So this is all good. We'll get back to Michael in just a second. If you've got a financial question, go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. While you're there, check out our service, Jill on Money Live. For 35 bucks, you'll have access to quarterly live webinars and special bonus content. The Jill on Money Show We will be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are trying to help you make better financial decisions. Doesn't have to be the best. Better is good enough for me. If you would like to come join us on the program, go to our website, jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. We'll get your note. Don't forget to check the box if you'd like to join us on the air live. And also, while you're on the website, do check out our YouTube show, Jill on Money, powered by The Compound. We love that show. It is a blast to do. Right now, let's get back to Michael, who's on the line from Seattle. What is the big fear right now? The big fear is I get blown out 
do I have to go back to work? Is that the question? Well, I'm not really ready to retire yet. I would like to keep working. And there are some things that I w- wanted to do before I retired, like buy property, build a cabin. You know, there's other things that I wanted not to use retirement money for. Okay. So are you highly employable? Like if I'm just doing, I, don't like, know. I hope you don't get, but have you looked or not? <laughs> I don't know. I would hope so. Have you been looking? I have not. Or not? I have not. All right. So time to look. Okay. Even if you don't have to make a lot. If So let's talk a little bit about the whole cabin thing. What would that mean in terms of cost? What would you be looking at in terms of cost? Well, I have budgeted about 200000 for that, hoping it's going to be a whole lot less. But I'm, I wouldn't think so. Don't you think whenever you budget something like that, it's rare that it comes? Oh, my God, it only costs 120 Doubt it, right? <laughs> okay. So of okay, of the 2.2 in brokerage, fair to say, well, gets how how much do you happen to know like the RSUs and the and the employee stock um op- ownership plan? Was that a big chunk of money? Was it like a million dollars? Was it five hundred thousand? No. What would you have an idea of what that was? Yeah, it it was less than five hundred thousand. But like a hundred or four hundred. Uh, I know three twenty was in cash, and then okay. the rest of it has been trickling in. So it's okay. kind of been so, hard to keep up with. Okay, but they're going to give you a tax form, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank God. All right. So let's just pretend that for we'll get the numbers. You got taken out. I don't know what part of that is capital gains. I don't know what part of it is long-term, short-term. I don't know what's ordinary income. We have no idea. Let's assume the worst right now. Let's presume that that 320 comes in and it just gets socked on top of your 140. Let's just say this is going to be a horrible tax year and all of that money is taxed at the 35% bracket just for the heck of it. Okay, let's just, let's do that, which is fine. Like, you know, taxes happen. People have things that are happening, right? So if we say that... uh just going to do a quick calculation. There's no state income tax in the state of Seattle. So worst case, this is what I think of your 2.181, we got to pay 112. And so I'm going to add, uh, let's just pretend out of your 2.18, you've got 2 million left. Let's just do that. That's the worst case. You got 2 million left, which is amazing because you have 2 million there. You have 1.1 in the retirement accounts. You have uh, the three something in Fidelity plus your 70 grand in brokerage. By the way, that Fidelity brokerage, why do we have two separate brokerage accounts? Because one was where all the other stuff went. Can we combine those two accounts, those two brokerage accounts? Do you mean the E-Trade and the... Yes. So E-Trade is where they put all the uh, cash at. By the way, this is exactly why Morgan Stanley bought E-Trade, because everyone who has those E-Trade accounts, they're going to be like, oh, I guess I'll just open up an account in Morgan Stanley, which you're not going to do. You're not going to do that. All right. So you have $2 million. You have all this other retirement money. You're fine. You don't spend any money. You're fine. Absolutely, positively fine. So even out of the $2 million, let's say out of the $2 million, we take, I don't know, forty grand for the 15-year-old's college, probably too much. Let's say it's 40 grand comes to there. I feel like at the end of the day, this is what you have in the brokerage, the E-Trade account. You pay your taxes. We put some money aside for the cabin. We put some money aside for college and you've got $1.75 million. You have cash on hand of 120. We have uh, your Fidelity account, which is you know, 350 plus the 78 in brokerage, and you've got 1.1 million in retirement. You're a hundred percent fine. You're fine. Cause you only spend four grand a month. You could probably spend five grand a month. Truly. You're great. So the question is, we need to be methodical about it. Right? So I think what happens first is you must like press the company. You're like, I need to know my tax liability. I'm making plans. Be the squeaky wheel or be nice about it either way. Okay. Next. Once you we have the actual tax liability. You're going to owe it in April. So whatever, keep that money in cash. So you have it. Yes. Then what we have to do is we have to think about, should you open up a 529 plan for the 15 year old or not? There's part of me that says, I'm not sure this kid gets beyond community college. So I'm not sure how much more I want to, how much I really want to put away and community college, you'd just pay out of cash flow, Wouldn't you? Yes. I mean, you could open up a 529 plan and put in like a nominal amount of money. Like how much is community college a year? Five grand, 10 grand? I don't even know what it is. Yeah, I don't know. Let's say it's, 
Let's say it's five. That's what I'm guessing. So you put 10 grand in the 529 plan right away. Just get it in there. Let it chug along. And then, you know, in a few years, you'll know more because probably you'll know more in by 16, 17, maybe it, by the time kid gets a little bit older, maybe doing well in, in school and say, oh, you know what? I don't want to do community college. I want to go to, you know, University of Washington, whatever it is, but you'll have, you'll be able to put new money into the 529. It's just, honestly, even if it's uh, just putting it into the fixed account for a few years, it, there's no tax liability. So you might as well use that. And then you can go out and buy yourself your cabin and your land and all that 200,000. You can either go out and do that immediately or What's the time horizon on doing that? Year, two years? What do you really think? Well, I was hoping to do it before I retire. All right. So then you take 200000 and you have that siphoned off and you're really good. Um, make sure you don't have this. So what you can know about the brokerage account at the end of the day, wherever you land, $1.75 million should be invested. Okay. The rest probably is going to be some combination of cash, CDs money in the 529 plan, money, you know, just money that you have access to. But the 1.75, you should feel free to allocate and invest. No biggie. Same deal on your retirement account. Um, the interesting thing here is that because it's all pre-tax, you know, most of it, there is a case to be made to convert it to a Roth. However, <laughs> here's my however. I kind of want to see where everything stands. Like, do I want to really soak up the brokerage account and the cash until I really want to see what happens with college and the cabin? So I think that we don't convert immediately. And I would not go nutty if you don't get, if this place, the new joint, if Nuco says, thanks for your service, goodbye, you can get a job. You'll get a job, but you do not have to worry about your income. I promise you that. You have plenty of money. You can you can make $90,000 a year. You'll be fine. You don't have to be working to build a cabin. You'd be nice to, but you you got enough money. You're good. There's nothing to be afraid of here. I don't see anything. There's like all good stuff here, really. Do you have your estate planning done? Um, I do. Good. Is it going to the nibbling? It I is. I had to say that. It is. <laughs> oh, my God. I got it. I'm in now. Well, that's what the kids say. So, you know. <laughs> There's so many things the kids say. You, I, and, and you have, you see, you're around a 15-year-old. I'm not. It's even worse. Mark, I we need Theo to keep us up to date on these things in the future. I'll know nothing. Nuco, the, it's done. Uh, is there, have there been big changes yet or not? Yes. No. Yes. But you have not yet been touched. Not yet. <laughs> You're hanging in by a thread. You're hanging on by a thread, aren't you? Well, it's it's the thread for me might be a little bit thicker than for others, but um, it's definitely the time will be coming when a decision will be made. But it could be not until the end of the year. All right. Well, I'm interested. Stay in touch, okay? Thank you so much. All right. For your My time pleasure. And Thank your you and good luck. If you're contemplating a change in your life or you want to run a game plan by us, just give us a holler. Go to JillOnMoney.com and click the Contact Us button. Jill on Money Show will be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Let's go to Thomas from New York. Thomas, what's going on? How can we help you? I'm ready to make a transition uh, from being a municipal lawyer to uh, going out on my own. I talked with you guys back in March of last year. I wanted to uh, do work some tennis tournaments around the uh, globe. Oh, I remember you. Mark wants your life. Um, give us, just run down a little bit of who you are and like what's going on for you. How old are you, Thomas? 52. And are you married or single? Married. And how old is your spouse? Uh, 51. And is your spouse going to be a, a, totally aboard on this plan or is there 
some convincing we have to do? No, she's on board. Okay. Um, she uh, will keep working for the uh, health insurance, although uh, I thought she would work more. She's also transitioning from she's a nurse. Oh. She works one shift every week in the hospital, but she's she's on a outreach bus, which is much easier. So she's going to go to that full uh, three, three days a week. How much will she earn three days a week? About 75000 And you'll have health insurance? Correct. Until you guys get to Medicare, right? No, I uh, get a pension at age 57, which includes I can buy into uh, the city's health benefits. Great. So age 57, how much is your pension? Uh, 100%, uh, 77,672. <laughs> how about if I just say 77? So that's 100% meaning just 100% your full life. Does your wife have a pension as well or not? Yes, uh, a little bit smaller. About age 62, she'll probably get about 30,000. And what's the haircut you take if you she takes a portion of your pension, like the joint and survivor number? Do you know it? Hundred percent is uh, about sixty nine thousand. Okay. Fifty percent is seventy three thousand. I like that sixty nine. I'm going with sixty nine. Okay. So for five years, how much she's going to make seventy five? What will you be making? You know, traipsing around the globe doing tennis tournaments. I mean, I'd transition into doing some private legal work, which would be the main pay thing. Okay. So, so how much could we make part? Could we? Could you make part time for five years? About fifty thousand, and I also am looking to do a side hustle. I know Mark doesn't like it. I'm a tennis fan, so but I am playing a lot of pickleball, and I, I'm going to get certified as a pickleball and pro instructor. Why? You know, Mark is a curmudgeon. Um, I there's a lot of consternation about the noise associated with pickleball. I was watching the Australian Open last night, and I saw ESPN run an ad for this tournament that they're going to be showing. It was like John McEnroe, Andre Agassi. I'm thinking to myself, if anybody is sitting home watching this, you really got to reevaluate your life. Okay, hold on a second. My high school boyfriend, John, who I adore, it's like my best ex-relationship of my life, he was a professional tennis player for five years, okay? And he no longer can play tennis anymore for a series of reasons. But we were laughing because last time I saw him, he said, because he was first anti-pickleball, because he's like, oh, my God, every idiot who can't play tennis can play pickleball. I'm like, I know, but, like, that's fun. It's great. Then he calls me up. He's like, I'm amending my whole pickleball thing. Why? Because he went to an exhibition where he went to see these professional guys playing pickleball. He said it is far more exciting than the current state of tennis. That's a little bit of a budget. You have a pro pickleball league I'm going to hopefully try out for too. Also, Thomas is going to be hustling and he's going to be betting. He's going to be the ringer who comes in and he's going to be like, okay, like $100 a match. Okay. So Thomas, if you're making 50 grand plus your pickleball income, your wife's making 75 grand. Will that be enough for you to pay your bills for the next five years? Yes. Total. Um, You're fine, right? 5,000 a month is our expenses. Oh my God. Fabulous. You have, you have a place in New York, right? Correct. How much is it worth? Uh, about four fifty. Mortgage is paid off. Okay. Let's talk about what you've saved so far. Let's go a little. Let's go in deeper into this. So, besides the two pensions, which are great, by the way, tell us a little bit about savings. Okay, I have uh, about seven hundred sixty-nine thousand in a uh, four fifty-seven. About one fifty is Roth. My wife has about uh, five twenty-five in a Fidelity mostly pre-tax. I have in a Vanguard uh, 126 in a Roth IRA. In a brokerage account, I have 320000 in Vanguard. And uh, uh, what about cash? About one hundred and twenty k in emergency savings. Great. All right. So just so we lay this out, I got my, I've got my great money reset for you, Thomas. So when are you giving your notice? Are we done? Like we're, we're really done? Uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks, <gasps> I'm, uh, I'm working the Miami open. So oh, in March. this is so great. Okay. So you give your notice and you create, you have some part-time income. You guys are fine at f- age 57. I think you're going to probably want to do the, like the, the joint in hundred percent, just cause you know, she's a woman, she's going to outlive you. We want her to not worry. It's not that big a haircut. You will be in, will you both be entitled to social security? Yes. And you plan to do that at 70? Uh, my wife 
has uh, cancer in her family, so she's thinking about taking it early, mm -hmm. although I don't know if she will at 62 or not. I mean, that's another reason I was thinking about taking the 100% joint survivor. Yes, absolutely. When you look at this, do you get anxious or not? Uh, I mean, a little anxious. You guys have kids? Yeah, two kids. One's a nurse. He was working in, in the city. It didn't work out. He's back home looking for his next job. Okay. And the younger one is, uh, we're hoping he gets into the plumber's union. He's working for a plumber's company, and he should be able to get into the union. Okay. So they're both launched. I think you guys are in really good shape. Uh, do you have any parents that you need to worry about? Uh, yes, my uh, parents. I mean, they're financially secure. Okay. Um, they uh, just did a trust. Oh. Do you know how much they have? Look at me. I'm like, hmm. Over $1.5 million. Oh, so, and you have siblings? Uh, one brother. All right. So there will be some inheritance down the line, hopefully not for a while. I don't see you having any problems. I mean, of course, there's a few things that are really important here. So we have framed this gang. Very few people have two people in a couple, let alone one person with a couple having a pension. So they have two pensions. You've done a very good job of saving. The house is paid off. You're willing to do work. I think the biggest difference in people who really want to reset and those who, you know, who have the, um, their eyes open about it is that you see that there's a transition period. And to some extent, Thomas, it could be. I mean, we don't know, but it could be that doing the part-time income and all this fun stuff that you keep doing it even longer. And obviously, the longer it is, the better it is for you guys. It's the Jill on Money Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you would like to join us on the air, just go to JillOnMoney.com and click the Contact Us button. And if you're shy, we do emails, like right now. Let's take an email from Holly. Holly writes, I am financially sound, but... My 53-year-old da daughter, oh boy, intergenerational, Mark, here we go. I'm financially sound, but my 53-year-old daughter is in a lot of debt. She wants to figure out the best way to consolidate making one payment rather than several. I gave her $15,000 for her birthday. She paid off her lowest three or four cards. I guess she means the lowest outstanding dollar amount. She looked into loans. One wanted 20% and, uh, oof. So one was a 20%, another one was 8% before it morphed to 36%. I've watched you for years on CBS. I know that you gave a talk about the best way to get out of debt. I wasn't taking notes because I didn't realize I would need to help my daughter. She writes, I could pay this off, but I don't want to because she really needs to budget her spending. But I want to help guide her towards independence. She's getting more and more depressed. I want to help. I want to support her and be there with love. But as with many financial problems, this is not just about finance. She says, my daughter wouldn't come on the show. She's embarrassed, mortified. She doesn't want others to know the mess that she's in. Now, here's the thing. I get where you're coming from, Holly. I would like to know one of the, some questions that I would ask about your daughter. And I would ask her to her face, hey, how'd you get into this debt? What happened here? Did you experience an event? Was it health? Was it loss of income because you lost your job? Was it a divorce? Sometimes when we can get to the root cause, we can better prescribe the way to get out. I think that the real idea behind getting out of debt is having her go through the money that is coming in, the money that is going out, and really understanding what's happening in that cash flow. And can she identify a little bit of money that she can allocate towards the highest interest debt? that's really important. I think that sometimes we just like, I know we like the idea like, oh, I just want to get rid of any debt. But, you know, a small amount that's maybe on a 10% a, a card, it feels good to pay that off, but I'd rather her work her way down if she had a 24% debt. I don't know about consolidation and I don't even know about paying it off for her. Maybe that would work. I would want to make sure that you're not sacrificing anything. And I'll tell you what, I would be willing 
Holly to have her come on and just talk to me and we'll change her name. And I would really hope that she would understand that we, we do not judge. So maybe give us a holler back, see if I could just have her come on, or maybe even have you come on and answer these questions and we could change a few of the facts so people don't recognize you or her. All right. I hope that helps. This is from Gigi. Quick question. If I'm a high earner and diligent saver, would it make sense to contribute to an after-tax brokerage account or max out a pre-tax 403B? Oh, listen to this. There's a lot of saving here. We already max out Roth 401k and a Roth 456 defined, this DCP must be a defined plan, defined contribution plan. Assuming the money grows for 20 years, would I be better off using a brokerage account and paying capital gains or pay ordinary income and have RMDs on the 403B? I'm going to answer that question, but just so everyone realizes, this is uh, combined household income with spouse, 400,000, 43 years old. They make side hustle income, 120 grand. Expenses are 10 grand a month. They got a lot of money saved. They've got uh, a million two in retirement accounts, a million two in retirement accounts. Also, she gets a pension and they've got, oh my God, they got tons and tons of money. So they got no mortgages, lots of houses. Everything is great. You know what? Here is what I would say. I would, if I were you, I'd use a brokerage account. That's what I would do because required minimum distributions are going to be kind of hefty because you have money that is already pre-tax so I think that it would be much, much better for you to pay that capital gains rate. And even if we have a sunsetting of the current tax plan and we sunset back, capital gains will be cheaper than whatever your income tax bracket will be. I can almost guarantee that. So um, I would say easy answer would be please think about the after-tax brokerage account. I know you're going to pay a lot of tax, but I think you can handle it. Okay. This is from Linda. Hi, Jill and Mark. Thanks for all that you do. I've been a dedicated listener since COVID. You are both wonderful. Oh, that's so nice. Like Mark, I recently bought a house with these miserable interest rates. Mine is seven and an eighth. My remaining loan is $240,000. It's 30 year. My current plan of attack, I pay my monthly mortgage bi-weekly and then also pay four grand a month toward principal. Jeez, that's a lot. Hold on. I'm considering increasing it. I have a strong emergency fund cash reserves, which are in five and a quarter percent. I legit hate this interest rate so much. My current plan is to keep it up till I can refinance. I'd love to pay the house off in 10 years or less. I'm 51. I make 140, 50 grand a year, separated, two kids, one kid launched, rocking it in New York City, Liz Midtown, and other almost done with college, doing great things. College covered. Love your reaction to my plan and advice you would offer. All right, Linda, listen to what I'm about to say. Stop the insanity. Do not make extra payments on this. Because if you're going to refinance anyway, get that money to work. That four grand a month could be put into a, some gorgeous brokerage account and maybe even your retirement account. Stop it. Stop paying biweekly. This is not the right strategy. Uh, so I don't know. You're making yourself crazy. But if you are going to refinance, no reason to make extra payments right now. Let your money work for you. Have it available. Okay. When we return, more of your questions. It's Jill on Money. back. It's Jill on money. And we love answering your financial questions or helping guide you as you're going through your life and trying to make big decisions. Maybe we can just be a voice of reason. If that's you, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. All of our content lives there. So check it all out. Okay. Let's finish up this hour with a note from Sonia, 
She writes, I owe back taxes that amount to $100,000 with interest. I was laid off eight months ago and unemployment ended. I want to settle with the IRS. Can I try to negotiate directly with the IRS to reduce interest? Or should I try to find a tax company that will negotiate on my behalf? Well, Sonia, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. It's so stressful. I get it. In my experience, I don't know if I would actually pay another company to negotiate for me because you're probably going to be able to plead your own case. Chances are the IRS will put you on some sort of installment plan. I think it would be very rare that they would negotiate on interest, but again, they may provide you with terms and time that would allow you to pay off this debt. If you are feeling skittish about doing it on your own, then perhaps I might work with a CPA who could at least walk you through the process and give you a sense of what your expectations should be as you start the negotiation. Hope that helps. Let us know. And maybe Jill on Money Community, if you have some experience with this, give us a holler and we can maybe give Sonia some ideas around how she can proceed. I'm always a little bit leery of these services that say we'll negotiate with a credit card company or with the IRS. You are usually your own best advocate. Don't forget that. And I think we often get kind of spooked by doing it ourselves, you're probably going to be better off that way and you'll save the money. All right. When we return, we're going to answer more of your questions. So during the break, you can go to jillonmoney.com. You can bookmark it and you can check out all the great content like my book, which is out in paperback, The Great Money Reset, all there at jillonmoney.com. We will be right back. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger welcome back it's the jill on money show the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life or at least attempts to do so let's talk to russell who's on the line from the pacific northwest okay so i'm a 57 and a half and uh, I'm thinking about retiring in the next five to seven years. I have a 401k uh, with uh, just over a million in it. And uh, I got, I had sold some rental properties. Oh, it's been five years now. And uh, I just never put that money to work. Uh, it's kind of sitting in cash. So I think I'm, I might be a little cash heavy. And I was just uh, wondering what your thoughts were. All right. You said you're 57 and a half. Are you married or single? Uh, single. And do you have kids? Yes, two, but they're both launched at 26 and 29. Okay. Right now, uh, you said you're going to, you want to retire in five to seven years, but would you want to accelerate that if you could? Is that part of your potential um, idea here and thinking about how to get the cash to work? Possibly. Uh, not in any real hurry to, I enjoy my job. So, uh, Okay. Happy Great. How much do you earn right now? Uh, about 135 a year. And do you um, live in a home that you own or a condo or something like that? Yes, own a home. How much is it worth? Uh, it's about 650 right now, it says. Is there a mortgage that's outstanding? Uh, no, it's paid for. And any other, you said you sold rental property, but any rental properties still that are in your um, picture here? Nope, I'm, I'm done with that. <laughs> So maybe you made a few bucks. So how much money's in cash right now? Uh, I have a uh, about two ninety nine in a bank in a savings account that's earning about four and a half to five right now. And so the little over a million in the four hundred one k, three hundred grand in the cash account. Any other accounts like a brokerage account or a Roth that's floating around? Yeah, I have a Roth with that's worth two sixty six and uh, forty eight thousand of that is in cash. And then I have another brokerage account that's worth 46 and it 22 of that is in cash. Why are you so cash heavy? You spooked by something? Uh, the world got you a little freaked out? No, I just, uh, I had that, sold those properties and then just, I should have been dollar cost averaging in, but I, I, I just didn't. And now I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> looking at it. And like, All right. Okay. 
All right. Yeah. Like, let's go. Uh, let me ask you another couple of questions here. Is there any cash outlay that you would have to make in the next couple of years that you can think of? And I mean, like it, it could be that uh, you've got two kids, one's going to get married, or it could be that you need a new car and you desperately want to buy, you know, a $90,000 something or other. But like, is there anything that's coming up uh, within two years? Possibly a wedding, but I'm hoping not to spend it all on that. But uh, uh, I, you're not, I'm not going to let you spend 300 grand on a wedding, but what do you figure like 50 or some, what, what is the right amount? I'm like putting that out in words in your mouth. So what do you think is a, the amount of money we should keep set aside? Yeah, maybe 30 to 50. Yeah. All right. When you say 30 to 50, I say 50. Okay. That's what I read. Yeah, that's probably what's Okay. Go. Right now, you're putting money into your 401k pre-tax or is it a Roth? Uh, it's pre-tax. How much money do you need to live on, Russell? If, I'm thinking around five right now because uh, I don't have a lot of own the vehicles in the house. And you're maxing out your 401k in on that 135 a year. You're putting in the max plus the catch up? Correct. Do you have a Roth option through work or not? Uh, no, it's just uh, just that, mm -hmm. the, the pre-tax. Okay, and I got you. And so the money you're, that you're saving has been mostly through your retirement account. And the money in the brokerage account, is that money that um, you're contributing into that account? Or did that come from previous, you know, whether it was the uh, the rental properties? But are you putting continue to put money in the brokerage account now? Yeah, it's uh... I, it automatically deducts about 200 bucks a month uh, that goes directly okay. into that. Okay, great. What do you feel like is, you know, if you say 50 grand, I'm sorry, uh, $5,000 a month or 60 grand is like what you spend in a year, where do you feel comfort in your cash reserves? Would it be 50 or 60? Is that okay for you as just a, oh, an emergency reserve fund, not the wedding part of it? Yeah, just uh, like six months of wages, uh, so another 50, you feel okay like that? Yeah, or, yeah, that I'd, okay? be, I'd be okay. comfortable with that. Okay. So now we know that of the $300,000 that is in the cash account, 100 has to be kept safe, right? Correct. So now we have $200,000 to invest. How do you feel about like pulling the trigger and just doing it versus setting up a plan to dollar cost average? Uh, I'm about 50-50, yeah. So uh, if you're 50 50, then I'm going to tell you what, I think it's easier to just dollar cost average then. OK, so we're going to put instead of doing a lump sum, since you really haven't been invested, I think I do think, by the way, the lump sum, you should just do that in whatever cash you have that's in retirement funds. Just get that to work. Don't mess around with that. You don't have to dollar cost average that. OK, you know, like you're not that money's going to be in there for a long time. So whatever is in cash, just put it to work. Don't look back. It doesn't matter. But for this two hundred thousand dollars, how about we just say twenty grand a month for ten months? Okay. Now, what is in the brokerage account right now? What kind of assets? Uh, I'm looking at that right now. The brokerage account has got it's mostly you know ETF spiders, uh, the QQQ. All right, that's that's fine. Is there any? Do you have bond positions in in the brokerage account or not? Uh, not in the brokerage account. Uh, in my Roth. Uh -huh. uh, I did buy some bonds uh, recently, Okay. ETFs. Okay, because maybe what you should do is, and maybe if you don't want to do it in the cash account and you don't want to have that as, you know, you say, oh, you know what? I want to have just nice index funds. That's going to be my stock stuff. That's okay because you do have this $100,000 that is left out, 50 for the emergency reserve, 50 for the wedding. But maybe, I mean, you don't have a state income tax in Washington state. So it might be worth it to put some kind of bond position inside of the brokerage account as well. And it can be just a intermediate term bond ETF. Use that as part of your strategy of your investing, your dollar cost averaging. I would really encourage you to make sure that this gets done. Here's what's going to happen. The first time the market goes against you, you might stop yourself and say, oh my God, right. I don't want to get this. But, but, but you don't have to worry. You're in really good shape. You've got a lot of money. We're going to get the money to work. And you don't have huge expenses, as you said, especially considering you're going to work for another five or seven years. Will you be due any pension from this job? Uh, no. 
And the Social Security benefit, do you have, do you, have you looked at that? Uh, yeah, it, it just – I did the quick calculator where you put your current salary in and it yeah. came out like 3800 a month, something like that. I mean, you're going to be fine. So we're really just investing for you to be more efficient. And also because I know the cash is going to be like, what's great is you're like, oh, it's at four and a half percent now. But as soon as it goes to two, you're going to be bummed. So I think we get you on the dollar cost averaging 20 grand a month. Pick a few funds, exchange traded funds, index funds, get that money in there and get that money to work. And for the the 100000 that you're keeping out for the emergency reserve and the wedding, you know, you can do a couple of things. You, you might say, let me just throw this into a, a one-year CD. When do we really think a wedding could take place? So like in two years or one year? Uh, two, I'm guessing. So maybe you throw it into a two, you may put the wedding uh, 50 grand, put it in a two-year CD and your emergency reserve you can keep is cash if you'd like. But really you are in, you're in great shape, man. Just like, let's get it going. If you would like to join us on the air, just go to jillonmoney.com. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Right now, let's talk to Tony, who's on the line from Tennessee. Hey, Tony, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? It's been a couple of years now. Yeah. So you're a recidivist caller uh, and, and emailer. So what's going on? Why did you get in touch with us initially and then... What can we do today? Uh, initially, I was I was feeling burned out on the travel um, in my job and looking to see if I was able to step away at 55. I've um, been a listener for about three years now, and this is my two-year checkup after that call. What did I tell you? Did I tell you that you could leave or not? Uh, you said I was okay, um, okay. Oh, but I, I, hope I, I still was right. you were you were you were against me paying off my house, and? Um, which I did. Any, I did it anyways. God dang it! Tony, what was the – wait a second. Hold on a second. What was the interest rate on that house? Uh, I think it was 2.9. You know what? I'm calling a personal foul on you right now. Go for it. Okay. I'm tur- I, Absolutely. Absolutely calling a curse, personal foul. How much did you pay that off? Like what was the lump sum to pay off? I think at the time I only owed like 150 left. Yeah, because you probably – just to be clear, in two years you could have been in CDs and made more than 2.9%. But okay, let's let's move on. Um, you, you now have a paid-off house. I, no, I, my soul is free. I have no debt <laughs> and not, not my house. Dude, I owe nobody your, nothing. your liability side might be zero, but your soul, I don't know. I'm not going to make be the judge of that. Tell me what else is going on. So are you still working on the burnout job? I, I am. I, I'm traveling. Um, and, you know, I, I still I think, you know, I think what it is, is the freedom, you know, at, at 55, will I have the freedom to do anything I want. Um, and I don't think it'll be nothing. But I just want to I guess I just want to continue to confirm. I think as yeah. I get closer, I turned 51 in November. So I am literally four years away. And I guess All I right. just want to make sure I'm going to be OK. Tony, are you uh, are you a soul, solo Tony, or is there a nope. Mr. or Mrs. Tony? I am married. My wife is uh, seven and a half years younger than me, so oh. I did it right. No, she didn't. <laughs> no, she didn't, but no, she I want to make sure that she married that you a bust to... out who won't stop, who's going to stop working at 55. Uh, does she work? She does, yes. How much does she make? Uh, she makes 90. Okay. And how much are you earning now, Tony? Uh, 165. You guys have kids? Uh, both have launched, um, doing well, tried Great. college, did not work out, and they are um, they are good and not coming home. So Wow. That's amazing. And how much is the house worth? Uh, 900 Wow. Going to stick around in that? Like if in four years, is that like, oh, I'm staying in this house or you're going to go someplace? No, I think the goal is to buy some land and to build. Um, I think we want to buy something, put something small on it. And then build the house that we want and then have that second house for a backup for parents that's for later, later, wow. later times. So is that something that's available to you in your area? In other words, is that like a pipe dream or do you have to go way outside of Nashville? Like what happens to do that? Uh, you have to go out. I mean, you have to go about an hour, hour, 45 minutes to an hour out. Uh-huh. Um, but that's something that we're, we're okay with. Okay. Um, 
my, and then my wife, I travel and my wife uh, works from home three days a week. So, uh, okay. You know, so it's, it's doable. Not, it's not the end of the world to, to drive in a couple of days a week. Okay. I get you. So let's deal with some of the assets first. I want to get back to this, uh, how we do the house thing. So um, right now, are you both making retirement plan contributions? Yes, we are both maxing out. Okay. And how much money do each of you have in your plans? And and do me a favor, give me the the pre-tax and the Roth if you have it. I mean, as a total number, um, it's 1.1 and 401k and IRAs. Of that, 160 is Roth. Okay, got and it. And currently everything we are putting in is Roth. Okay. So that's retirement accounts. What about non-retirement yes. accounts? Um, I have the deferred comp hmm. of about 540000 that pays out upon termination or leaving. Hmm. Um, and then non-retirement, we have cash of 50000 and a brokerage of about 75000 Okay. So can we go back to the deferred comp for a second so I understand what the rules are on that? Okay. So let's presume you somehow get to your magic 55 number. How is that money, that 540, is it delivered as a lump sum to you? Unfortunately, um, I think all but 75,000 will be lump sum. Mm, and so okay. I want to retire probably January, February, because I, I will take a huge tax hit on It'll okay. probably pay out four twenty. Well, I mean, at today it would be four twenty to four fifty would pay, and that's all taxable, right? And that's all taxable, correct? And there's no way to dribble it out. It, there's a huge penalty. Well, uh, it's, it's a time penalty if I want to change it to the fifteen year um, payout. There's a time mm, penalty. You know, I'm probably thinking what you're thinking, which is, you know, it would be great if I could like move it one more year or spread it out from 55 to 60. But okay, it sounds like that's not happening. Okay, it's four years from now. And what happens with your wife's income? Will she also scale back or will she continue to work? Um, She sounds like 70, 30. Like I think she wants to do, it's not that we don't want to work. I said, I think we want to do less. And so okay. when I asked her, I asked her last week and, you know, I said, okay, when I step away, are you going to step away? You're going to keep working. Mm -hmm. Um, She's like, I think I'm going to step away too. So okay, so in that, in from so from your age fifty five to your age sixty five, um, what's the game plan for health insurance? Go to the, do the Affordable Care Act or work enough hours someplace to get health care? The company I work with, that's one of the benefits, is I've been here long enough that I qualify for their uh, retirement insurance, so I get mm. to stay on their plan at their rates for until I until I go to, to Medicare. That's so awesome. So deal. you get so you get those ten years. We have to worry about your wife for the end of you know what I mean because to account for the right. seven years. But we'll deal with it, right? We'll see where we yep. are. So let's say it's um, you're fifty five to mm, I'm going to call it sixty five. What should I count on in terms of between the two of you? It does not have to be all or enough, but like you make over a couple hundred thousand now. Like, what do you think you guys would earn together? I would say I would say on the the low ball would be fifty thousand is what I okay. what I put on paper. Okay. And without your mortgage, what do you um, estimate your your uh, expenses are? Currently, we're, we we um, we don't hold back much, but we're not spenders. Our current current budget seven thousand a month. It could be it could be thirty nine hundred if we buckled up. What but, you know? What do you mean? Where's that extra three grand going? I, like my uh, allowance is probably. $1,000 a month for allowance for what she wants to shop and do is $1,000 a month and then just house stuff. That's weird you just said the word allowance. I don't know why that like struck me as weird. Well, because I don't, I don't want to judge where she spends her money or the same thing. It's like you spend it on anything you want. You want to buy, you know, Rolos? Go ahead. You know, it's like. So you each take some amount of money that's like your screw off money. You do whatever you want with it. You each of you Correct. do that. Okay. I got it. Correct. Cause it made it sound like, Oh, you were giving her, but you have no, no, it. not okay. at all. No, okay. it's, it's whatever. So we're not judged. We're not all judging right. each other. I got so you. Buy whatever you want. Okay. So if 7,000 a month is rich, what's, what's the right number? Is it six? It's probably, it's probably 5,500, 5, $5, $5, $5, $5, $5, $5, $5, $5, $5, $5,000 would be pushing it and would let's, be, let's say, I guess what, what I've found is when we get to that level mm. for what we make and what we've done and how like how well I think we've done, mm -hmm. it, it makes us – it's almost punishing ourselves 
Yeah, I think we so need to live now and live later. Let's say six grand then. Let's just do six grand a month. That would be our expense number. So right now, tell us about how you're you're saving, you're maxing out for your retirement plan. Are you also putting money into the brokerage account actively? Yes. How much are you putting into the brokerage account? About 2000 a month. Um, mm. That just is extra money that I just throw at it. That's great. So I'm sort of thinking out loud here. If Tony is going to retire in four years and already has, let's just call it a million bucks in pre-tax and the 160 in Roth, there's cash, there's brokerage. Considering that you want to step down early, I feel like it might be better for you to not put as much money into your retirement account and put it into your brokerage account because you are going to need it. If you have a financial question, just go to jillonmoney.com and click the Contact Us button. The Jill on Money Show, we will be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Let's get back to Tony from Tennessee. So in four years, you're you're both done. But between the two of you, you make 50. We know that you need, let, let's just say we need another uh 40 grand out of the account, uh, you know, maybe it's 35, but whatever, you know, you need, you need your $72,000 a year net in expenses, right? I'm just going to, I'm going to make it 75 grand. So we need 25 grand a year from the, the, the net proceeds of the deferred comp, right? You're going to have 350. So we'll have 75 grand a year for four years. I'm not inflation inflation right. adjusting this, right? So this this kind of gets us there, right? Because it's close. You can't go crazy investing this money, obviously. You know what I mean? Because you know, we need three hundred of the three fifty. So, you know, you could do something. We'll have to see when you actually are retiring and what the environment is and whether you should buy CDs or buy some laddered bonds. But of that three hundred fifty, three hundred is going to be used to plug your cash flow hole, unless you're making more than you think. You know what I mean? Like, the, but let's just right, right. let's pretend, in, for all intents and purposes, let's pretend that of the three hundred and fifty, you burn up three hundred by the time you get to say, you know, you're sixty years old. How does that feel? It leads me to one of my other questions, and I, I listen, I listen to you on a regular basis, obviously, and. Mm. You know, you went off on um, you, you don't rant, but you went off on a rant on uh -oh. uh, Social Security at sixty two, yeah, a couple of weeks back, yeah. and it's and bad. what you said was like you guys have to stop taking it at sixty two. Can you help me understand? Because the the calculators that I use, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't seem to make that big Here's, of a difference. Is it is it a it, different philosophy that I'm missing? Um, well, are you in terrible health? Um, I'm, I, I mean, I have an autoimmune disease, but I don't think that's terrible okay. Okay. and it's manageable. So. Okay. So the, the deal is, uh, uh, sorry that you have that. First of all, that sucks. The, the deal about social security is when you take it at 62, you get a 25% reduction for life. So it's just a rotten deal. If we get you to age 67, your full retirement age, then you are much, you've got a higher base on which you get a cost of living adjustment every year. And for you guys, it's going to be important. That social security is going to be important to you. I feel like, you know, for the, for four or five, six years, you're fine, right? So if you get to age 55, you know that you can get to 62 probably on the deferred comp, right? But then we have 62 to 67, and we need to know what's going to happen for those five years. And for you, you might say, well, if I take social security, it'll be fine. But you really, if you live to like 76 or something, it's a terrible deal. If you die quickly, it's a great deal, but it doesn't sound like that's you. It's like, and you know, you both, 
and especially with a younger wife, it is far more important to maximize the amount of money that you have coming in from the social security system, mostly because it's no risk. So I guess that from looking at where you are, I think that your game plan can work because the deferred comp gets you through, well, I don't know, 55 to 62, let's call it. Okay. That's you burn that through at age 62. You still have your million dollars of retirement, which is now more, right? It's like you said, 1.1, maybe it's, maybe it's one and a half. Okay. Some of it is pre-tax. So from the age of say 62 to 67, instead of converting it now and using your cash, I would just plan to say from 62 to 67, I will slowly pull money out of my pre-tax retirement. I'll pay the tax due on it. You'll be in a low tax bracket. I mean, even if tax brackets do sunset and go to other levels, you're you're only making 50 grand a year. So I think that that's a good time to start saying instead of, I'm concerned that if you take your money, you know, when you retire, if you take all that deferred comp and then just convert everything, you're sort of stuck in a game plan. Whereas you could dribble the money out of your your pre-tax retirement account from 62 to 67 and you'll get the money out. It'll be the same difference, except you will actually have the money come out before Social Security kicks in. And I think that'll probably get you pretty close. There's one wah wah in this whole scenario. And let me just say what it is. The idea of buying land and building the house that you want, 45 to minutes to an hour outside of where you live, is a game plan that is workable if you have the equity from your house. It is not a game plan where you maintain a $900,000 house. It would be really tough to build a case of how it could work for you to have all the money that you have using that for your cash flow when you're looking ahead, but then dipping into that to build the second home and maintaining the primary. So could you live with building your your land and your house after selling your $900,000 asset? Is that a possibility? Yeah, the, I think the plan is to, well, I mean, there, there's two ideas. One is to go buy the land now and then decide what we want to do. Two would be to buy the land, go ahead and um, sell, put a manufactured home on the land, something nice that the parents can move into later on, live there for a year as we build. Um, so really, I mean, we would have a lot of open cash, as, but we would be using it to build. Mm-hmm. So I, I wouldn't want to maintain both. Yeah, okay my primary and build that that wouldn't be the plan at all Mm -hmm. it's either buy the land and wait um and i I guess that was one of my questions is like if i if i wanted to do that would would i want to do a heloc or do something silly like that no you just you you screwed me because you i want my 150 grand back don't i because you had 150 (laughs) grand and you paid it off you paid off a 2.9 percent loan what's a heloc now I have one sitting there that I've never used. It's at nine percent, but it's yeah. it's silly. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. yeah. You see why the whole paying off yeah, yeah. feels good in the moment, but now we're not going to do that. Okay. I'll tell you what I think. I think not buying it right now makes more sense. Let's see what happens with your in laws. Let's see what happens with all these uh, um, older generation. I feel like we're making a game plan with very um, with a few too many open unknowns that will be knowable in. Or, or at least more knowable in four years. Don't you think like that? We'll have just have more information. So I would rather wait and not do anything. I mean, look, you're going to tell me, well, real estate prices are going up. Nashville's so hot. Okay. If something fabulous were to come along, I guess, of course, that's also a reason to kind of skip the retirement contributions and build up the brokerage account so that you have more access to cash that has already been taxed. If you need to run an idea by us, a scenario, a plan, all you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. Mm 
You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here trying to help you make better financial decisions. So if you need some assistance or you just got a big change going on in your life or something's coming up and you just want to run an idea or run your game plan by us, all you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com, and click the Contact Us button. When you do that, a form will pop up and you complete it. That's an email. So for shy people, of course, we do emails from time to time. And then if you would like to join us on the audio show, you check that box. And if you are really feeling bold, all you need to do is check the box to join us on our YouTube show. So it's video. Jill on Money powered by the compound. Just check off that box as well and we'll get you on. All right. So we did say we like to talk to shy people too. So let's do an email. This is from Christy, listens to the podcast daily on her commute to work. She lives in the New York City area. My husband has become incredibly interested in options trading. I was an options trader. You're talking to the right girl. Um, he is considering a new endeavor. I'm not sure that YouTube is the best source of advice here. My husband is incredibly capable, a PhD level scientist running a research program at a top medical school in the country for many years. I don't think he's got the foggiest idea how to get more education, formal or otherwise, in order to make this his next endeavor. I'm terrified that in his excitement, he'll lose our life savings. I know that you were an options trader once. Yes. Given your experience in our NYC resident, um, residents, could you recommend a way for him to get more information from credible sources? Yes, I can do that. Give me a second. Most of what he brings to me comes from random internet sources. To be frank, they seem like scams that promise to teach you all you need for 10 grand. While we have the money, I feel uncomfortable that many of these companies don't seem legit. Also, Jill, am I crazy? Their websites are all of trader success stories and they're all men. Yeah, they are. They're dopes. Anyway, this is likely far removed from your normal question. Likely not fit for your show. Yeah, it's fit. Everything's fit for the show. Any advice you could give would be much appreciated. Okay. I'd love to talk to your husband. How about this? I'm going to give your husband carte blanche to get on the show with me. First of all, there are many wonderful books that he should be reading to familiarize himself with options. Okay. And this, you don't have to take a course you don't have to take a course, all right? And anything that promises you to be get rich quick is useless. It's absolutely useless because you know it's just, it is just a scam. And if he's so smart, he is not going to need a course to do this. I, I, I'm, hold on, I'm going to just lean over to my bookcase for a second and look at some of these titles. Stand by. Yeah, I got like six books in my bookcase and they're all really, um, if you... If you understand statistics, and I think as maybe he's a researcher, he probably does, that's kind of the key to options. But here's the real issue. Christy, I would like to talk to both of you at the same time so that we can come up with a, a game plan for how he could do this and experiment without blowing everything. So the first thing that has to happen is, as you know, in a money, in a great money reset is we have to see where you are today. And that would mean that we look at how much money you guys have accumulated and whether or not there is some fraction of that that we could, you know, hive off to create an options trading account where your husband starts learning whether or not he can really do this. I would never give up my full-time job for this. The last person I know who told me about this, just to be clear, <laughs> is somebody who got caught up in the Madoff scandal. And she told me all about her grand idea about how she was going to trade options to make money. And, uh, you know, not only had, did she lose her grand, her big fortune with Madoff, she got a bunch of it back. She then um, very quickly found a way to lose about 40% of it trading options. So there's your scary story. You're right to be nervous. He is really fooling himself. And just because you actually have a PhD doesn't mean you have any common sense. That's my two cents. Hi, Jill and Mark. This is from Nolan. Inspired at least in part by listening to your Annie Duke interview. I decided to take the plunge and leave my job of 13 years last spring. The reason I mentioned this is that at the time I was between positions, I had spent down a good amount of my cash reserves. So I spent much of the year building those back up. As a result, I hadn't maxed out my Roth IRA for 2023. I understand I have until April 15th to do so. I have about three grand left toward that max, and I have a plan to make that happen in time. That said, a comment from Ed Slot on the Jill on Money live event got me thinking, would it be better to spend that $3,000 as tax due on a traditional conversion rather than simply invest it directly? 
if my back of the envelope math is correct, I could convert about $13,000 in assets with this amount and remain in the 22% tax bracket. Wondering your thoughts on the upside and downside of each option. I'm convinced by Ed's arguments that tax rates and brackets are likely to go up in the future. And realistically, this may happen January 2026. So I'm motivated to get as much converted as possible. I'm 46, married, no kids. 319 grand in investments, about two-thirds stocks, one-third bonds, all low-cost low index funds. Um, okay, 75% of my money sits in a traditional IRA, 2% in a 401k, 15% in a Roth, Roth 401k, blah, blah, blah. No pension, estimated monthly Social Security benefit at 67, almost 3,000, 3,700 at 70. Uh, okay, you know what? I think that this makes sense for you. I would convert it. I would convert it definitely. That would be fine with me. Use that three grand, convert it. And especially when you're in the 22% tax bracket, it's really hard to argue with that, isn't it? If something's going on and you need a little bit of assistance, uh, maybe a coach or a little pat on the back or a, maybe a gentle nudge, we're here for you. Just go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. While you're there, check out our service, Jill on Money Live. For 35 bucks, you'll have access to quarterly live webinars and special bonus content. The Jill on Money Show. We will be right back. You're back. It's the Jill on Money Show. And before we conclude this hour, let's do an email. This is from Anonymous, who writes, what is your opinion on QLACs? Q-L-A-C's. I'll explain this in a second, gang. Are they a good strategy to reduce required minimum distributions for baby boomers who may have too much stashed away in pre-tax 401k accounts? Or are they just another annuity to be avoided? My understanding is that you can divert up to $200,000 from a 401k until your 80s to reduce your RMD and that if later used on health expenses, taxes could be avoided. Is this a too good to be true sales pitch? Well, I had to go brush up on my QLAC to be honest with you because I couldn't really remember all the details. So QLAC stands for Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. So yes, it is an annuity contract and it's a deferred annuity. And there is an interesting part of this contract that does allow you to push away some of the money that's in your traditional 401k or IRA and put it into your QLAC, which would reduce the amount of money that is in your retirement account balance, which reduce the amount of your required minimum distribution. But in my understanding is that this is just a temporary tax break. I think that at 85, the IRS says you have to take RMDs also from your QLAC, which means that you are deferring your RMD, not avoiding it. At the end of the day, there may be better ways for you to deal with RMDs in the future. Maybe it's a Roth conversion. Maybe it's pulling money out of the account now while you know what your tax bracket is. I'm not sure, but I really would love to get another set of eyes on this as an idea from somebody who is a fiduciary so that you don't feel like someone's just selling you something without understanding your whole big picture anonymous. I hope that helps. Okay, that's it. That is the program. Remember, all of our content lives at JillOnMoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Telercio is our executive producer and web king. Try to lift someone up. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. <music> 